So I would like to introduce you to Eric Folk from the Center on Disability Studies. And after him will come Ha'aheo Pagan from the College of Windward Community College, and he's going to talk about disability services. So Eric, you have the share screen. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so how much time do I have? Because I don't want to bowl over <laughs> the other speaker's time. You have 15 minutes, so about until 1040. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Folk, and I am a principal investigator on a number of projects at the Center on Disability Studies, which is a part of the College of Education at UH Manoa. Um, we have a number of grants that are focused or contracts that are focused around supporting individuals with disabilities, including intellectual and developmental disabilities to go to college. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, a little bit about that. We also have a grant um, contract with the Developmental Disabilities Division to offer self-determination training for groups, individuals, and parents. And to date, we've done hundreds of these presentations um, across Hawaii, across the islands, remote, and also on the US mainland, we've done several as well. And what we're basically trying to do with that training is to raise the bar on awareness of what it takes to help people become self-determined. And I'll be sharing information about that later. But the main message about what I'm talking about today is to let you know about options for students with disabilities to go to college. And I wanna start with just uh, two quick stories. Um, about 11 years ago, we started working on our first national federal TIPSID grant out of the United States Department of Education. TIPSID is T-P-S-I-D, and it stands for Transition Programs for Students with Intellectual Disabilities. So what we're doing with that, and what we've been doing for that over the last 10 years is building capacity in our community college system, the UH community college system, to, to support students with ID to go to college. Fully, full inclusive opportunities. We don't do anything in groups. We don't do anything separate. No classes that are special. Students take the same classes as anybody else. Typically, if you're a student with an intellectual disability, you start with us the summer before and doing some uh, you know, summer curriculum to get ready for college. We've probably met you in, um, in your high school and right before you transition. And then you do coaching with us about three hours a week and you take a class or two to start. And then hopefully what happens is we build from there and the student will continue on through college as far as they wanna go. We offer a certificate through our center that's for you know, a two year participation program at a standard. And that's you know, just issued through our center. But our hope is that the students will go to college like anybody else. A certain number of people, who are, you know, typical or not, will go to college and decide it's not for them. A certain number will go for a few years and not complete. Now, a certain number will go and complete and possibly move on. So what we're trying to do is create that same level of opportunity for students with ID, students with dis developmental disabilities and other disabilities. And all we're trying to do is create access. What the students decide to do with that access is, is up to them and their vision for their future. And we're there to help them support that vision. I know that was a lot of talking, so I'm going to start sharing a little bit and go into a little more detail. But basically, I just want you to come, uh, come think about this, oh, the two stories. And then one thing I want to tell you first is students with ID can go to Vanderbilt. Students with ID can go to the Ohio State University. They can go to Georgia Tech. They can go to University of Georgia. They can go to UCLA. And so over the last 10 or 20 years, we've been really building up capacity to support students with ID specifically, but and other disabilities as well to go to college. So some of those programs aren't fully inclusive. They'll have an inclusive component. But the, the real thing to remember is if, if, you think you're a child, if you're thinking of college as it was 10 years ago that, and how we treated people with disabilities, especially more significant ones, it's different now. There are a lot more opportunities. Across the US, there are over 300 programs that support students with ID to go to college. So the two stories I wanna tell you about is about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, we started working with Farrington High School and Laura Paul, who is a very well-known transition teacher there. And we met a bunch of students and a bunch of students started first year, we started with four students with ID and the program built over the years. And um, two of those students who started with us early on you know, at first struggled. One of them was a diploma track student. One of them was a certificate student. And they both um, 
had on their record that they were individuals with intellectual disabilities. Well, we didn't know what to expect. So the students we work with went through the developmental courses and they started taking English 9, English 19, those early classes, and eventually started passing those. Some of them passed them from the beginning. And one of those students passed wing English 100. And at that point, we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, this person's very motivated. They work hard. They have a very supportive family. And then the other, the other person who was there too, it was, it wasn't getting the support from family, but it was working very hard as well. And again, both of these people scored less, less than 75 on IQ tests and they wanted to go to college. One of them was told by their college counselor and other teachers, oh, college isn't for you. It's, it's going to be too hard and you're not ready for it. Which is one of the main points we make is the students we work with are underprepared for college. It's who's to say the challenges they face in college are about their disability. They've never been talked to about college or in most cases prepared for college. So these two individuals kept going and they took classes and they passed classes and they passed classes. And pretty soon they started seeing college as a real option for them. Two students of ID scoring less than 75 on IQ tests. Before we knew it, both of them had earned certificates at the UH Community College, you know, Honolulu campus and human development. And before I knew it, both of them had jobs, part-time jobs, you know, what we call uh, transitional employment in DBR language, and wanted to keep going to school. So they had a certificate. Many students go to college just for a certificate, and once they get that, they go out. It's before an associate's degree. Both of them decided they wanted to keep going. One of them got his associate's degree in human development, and we're like, whoa, cool, <laughs> this is great, you know? And then the other one um, got one class away from her associate's degree, but decided she wanted to transfer to UH Manoa. She had the credits, she had the grades, and we're like, how do we do that? <laughs> you know, how are we gonna help this person? You know, well, how do we support them? And it was the same model. She transferred to UH and is dormed. <laughs> and after the first semester, she passed all of her classes. We're like, whoa, this is incredible. So she had actually ended up speaking at the HCC graduation for seven minutes in front of the whole Waikiki shell talking about her experience and it's pretty amazing. So the other student seeing this student go to UH said, I wanna do that too. And he had already earned a certificate. So I, he I has an associate's degree. So he transferred to UH Manoa. So fast forward to today, um, one, both of these students work for us cause they're so good. I mean, they, they're so good. I wish I had, I didn't wanna interrupt their weekends or I would have brought them here today to talk to you about their own stories but you'll have a chance to hear their stories in the future. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. So fast forward to today, uh, one of the students is about to graduate next semester with a university degree, bachelor's degree in um, human development and family studies. But, you know, that's really incredible, incredible because just like a semester ago, she returned from doing international student exchange to London during the peak of COVID. The whole time we were coaching her two or three hours a week. And um, the whole time she's developed an incredible amount of skills and an incredible amount of work ethic. Both of these stories are very unusual, but they show you the high end of what's possible with a lot of dedication and commitment. And, oh, I see Joe is uh, someone, one of their students is on her today. At any rate, um, I just wanted to tell you these stories because the student started from maybe not being able to cross the street by herself or make change to graduating or earning a certificate, transferring to UH Manoa, um, going on international student exchange by herself, <laughs> figuring out how to do that by herself with coaching support and being successful there and coming back. And now she's on the verge of earning a bachelor's degree. And she's been dorming the whole time too. Pretty incredible, it blows my mind just hearing myself talk about it. <laughs> but um, you know, it's a range of what's possible. Other students we work with said after a semester, hey, college is not for me. Some went on for a couple of years. There's a range of outcomes that represents basically hopefully close to what typical students have. And the main reason we're trying to do this is because college is an opportunity to be in a safe environment of high expectations. You know, you can start with one class in a community college program and just try it out. You have a coach helping you along the way, trying to develop those skills you'll need. And all along our coaches are also focusing on the long-term picture. So even one semester or two semesters of college is associated or correlated with higher earning outcomes for individuals over a lifetime. 
So our point is, let's get them in. If they can get for one semester or two semesters or three years or 10 years, no matter what, it's going to help them. It's a great environment to learn and grow. They, they like to shed that special education label, and they like to develop these you know, abilities to deal with these higher expectations. And the main thing we do during this time is we also try to help them develop the skills they need for self-determination. They get a lot better at making their own choices. They get a lot better at making their own decisions. They get a lot better at problem solving and decision making. And all along the way, they have a coach that's there to help them. But the coach is not telling them what to do. The coach is not tutoring them. The coach is supporting them to learn skills. So that's how the program is supposed to work. I'm going to quickly share a couple of things because I think I've <laughs> that was what, 10 minutes already, yeah, Amanda? I forgot what time I started. You're good. You're good. Okay. You're all right. All right. So I'm going to zip, ooh, zip through this slideshow right quick just to give you some uh, background, more background. So we're called the Post-Secondary Support Project, PSP, and we're at the Center on Disability Studies at UH Manoa. And that's the grant information if you're interested in it. So I'm going to just tell you really quick, what we're working to do here is to create inclusive college campuses that provide support for people with a variety of abilities and support needs to be successful. And we provide transition and post-secondary support for students with ID, well, all the disabilities beyond what is provided by on-campus supporters. And just really quickly, we have three programs. They have different entry points. There's our TIPSID grant, which is specific specifically for students with ID. Participants in this program go to college like everybody else. They don't receive financial support from us. They go to college, they figure out how to take a class or two in the community college system, which isn't that expensive. And then we provide the support at no cost that coaching support that I mentioned. We also have a contract with the Developmental Disabilities Division, who's been a very strong supporter. And basically, if your student is with DDD and they are interested in college, the, uh, the gateway is very wide open for that. Uh, you just have to ask your case manager about the PSP program and they can refer you to us. The next way we have in is we can support students with any disabilities that are clients or potentially eligible for services through DVR, but this is a DVR gateway. So you have to talk to your counselor about it and you know, we can share information with you about our programs, but DVR is the, the valve that can offer this service. And in general, they're very, very supportive of, of these programs. So if you're a client of DVR, you wanna to go to college, that college fits with your career goal, then DVR will talk to you about, you know, possibly referring you to our program. So those are the three main pathways into our program of support. Just a little bit about our model components. Um, we're based on high expectations. We expect students to achieve at whatever level they can do with hard work. What I wanna say here is, yeah, students with ID and other disabilities, they might have high-end limitations on what they're you know, capable of. They might have significant challenges to analytical thinking skills and things like that. However, we don't know. We don't know what their limit is because probably we haven't tested it that much up till now. So we want to leave open the opportunity that some of these students are going to really bloom. They're going to work 30 hours a week on this stuff and they're going to, they're going to fly at high levels and others are going to grow a lot, but maybe not that much. And others are going to find a little bit of growth over time but we're trying to have a program that supports all those levels of growth. And a big thing that we do is the self-determination training. Talk about that in a minute. We really focus on person-centered planning, at, um, not only as meetings, but also that the person is working on their individual plan. That's supposed to say front door first, but basically the idea is before we provide any support, we uh, look at what's available on campus and we support the student to go to that support. So instead of tutoring, our coaches will, talk to the student about what they need help with and how to get help. So we're kind of a facilitator of support. Uh, our coaching model changes over the time. It might at the beginning be very much about like uh, how to get your ID, but that'll change over time to be like, how do you get a job? You know, So it changes as the student matures and grows. We also have a peer mentoring component. The best model for learning is people, the, the person is most like you, which often is your peers. So we have peer coaches or peer mentors that also work directly with the students by request. So front door first, talked about that. Don't have time to talk about it more. Uh, one thing I want to mention about the adaptive coaching model is we're trying to be as invisible as possible. And one of the things we say is 
you might not have heard of us because we don't have t-shirts, we don't have an office, we don't advertise our program as much as try to support the student to be a college student like anybody else. So we try to be as invisible as possible in our, our service provision. We also, uh, there's an activity we do every end of July, early August, it's called Camp Manoa. It's four days, three nights in the dorms at UH Manoa. It's a full day of training each day. It's not a camp for fun. <laughs> it's hard work, but the students still have fun. And the focus of the whole training is self-determination. And it, we will be sending out flyers about that, um, I don't know, <laughs> later. It, it's gonna be, uh, I think, the last or third week of July. And information will be flowing through the original, uh, like through DBR and DDD and whatnot. Um, it's a really fun activity. There's uh, peer coaches there. There's, um, there's co uh, typical college you know, counselors as well. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a rigorous thing, but the students really enjoy it. At the end of the camp, they present about their journey. And those presentations are amazing. So for more information about that, we'll share our contact information a little later. So the other thing I want to mention is self-determination training, for, or we call it self-area. This is an opportunity that's presented by the Developmental Disabilities Division, and Mary Brogan has been very supportive of this opportunity. Um, basically, we teach an hour and a half to two hour intro session to self-determination. So I'm going to share information about that. We offer this training to individuals at school. We go to some schools and do that training. We do this training for professionals. We do it for small groups. We would love to do it for parent groups. If there's any parent groups out there that would like to have this, thanks to DDD, there's no cost for the training. I'll be sharing you that information in a little while. That's okay. So the reason we're doing this is because self-determination has been a huge phrase in our field forever. And, and this is... Got it. And this is uh, something we all need to work on together to build capacity. And so the more we all know about self-determination, the more we'll be on the same page. Okay, this is a flyer. And the flyer is explaining our uh, self-determination training. And this is, if you email me or put your name in the link in the chat, we can email you this directly, or I can give it, actually a better way, I give it to Amanda to share. But this is a PSP and there's this other program called the Pacific Technical Assistance Center on Transition. That's also us, <laughs> then CDS and the DDD. So this will give you contact information and we'd love to share that with you. A uh, couple quick things. In March 2022, we're planning some college information sessions. Uh, if you're interested in those, please email us at cdspsp at hawaii.edu. We also are trying to put together a mailing list or inclusive post-secondary education network. If you're interested in being on a mailing list, it's CDS PSP2. So either do mailing lists or information sessions or both. If you send us the email, we'll get you that information. Also, we're looking for members to help our inclusive post-secondary advisory committee, which we'll be assembling to help us set up four-year programs at our universities. All right, here's more information. Uh, oops, there's my phone number. I guess you can have it now. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out. We'd love to talk to you about it. And I'll be available for questions if we still have time. Thank you for everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. That was a lot of really great information. So we will have time for questions and answers um, at the end. So start putting those in the chat. Anything that's coming up, we've got some opportunities coming up for the spring and the summer. So um, look for that information. We will get this posted up on the Footsteps of Transition website. Eric, if you can please stop share, there we go. And our next presenter is gonna talk about the disability offices at the different colleges around our state. And that is Ha'aheo Pagan. So take it away, Ha'aheo. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ha'a Hill. I am a career and transfer counselor at Windward Community College. And today I'll be sharing some of the services that we offer both on our campus, but seamlessly transition through across the University of Hawaii system. So some of the, most of the things um, that we offer on our campus are offered system wide um, in some way, shape or form. And for today, I don't have a presentation, but I do want to um, point your direction to our disability services website where it does um, include some of the information that we provide, right? Out of our office, we provide access to all students. And I'll go over some of those documents that are required for that. But for now, I did put the link to our disability services website and on our campus, and I'll share it as well. 
So specifically for our campus, um, there are a number of different accommodations that we can provide for students. Like I mentioned before, this stems across the University of Hawaii system. And some of those services um, to access were, uh, are extended test time, distraction-free environment. So whether that be um, reserving a room or a quiet area to do tests, homework assignments, exams, uh, we have readers, subscribe, um, subscribers, we have technology that um, helps with note taking, helps to transcribe different areas of readings, whether it be PDF, PNG, the list goes on. Enlargement of printed material, adaptive equipment, including calculators, tape recorder materials, alternate formats, meaning so with regards to actual courses, we have a, a wide range of offerings. We have online courses, or we can do them specifically online, which we call asynchronous, a mixture of uh, in-person and online, which is our hybrid. And then we have strictly on campus, right? Um, in-person courses. So uh, we have a, a range of different types of opportunities for coursework at the post-secondary level. Uh, we also have a designated parking and access for persons and students with disabilities, wheelchair, wheelchair ramps, note takers, class relocation and use of adaptive equipment. So when I go over all of those, uh, like note takers, we have specific tutors and or peer mentors where we can provide students with note takers to sit in the class, whether the class is offered uh, online via Zoom or in person. And with regards to accessing these services at any of the disability services offices across the University of Hawaii system, um, and more specific to our campus, the requirements for us is, of course, we have to meet with our interim disabilities counselor, Roy Inoy. I have his information down right here, and I'll also post that in the chat to make it uh, readily available. So we have his location to our offices on our campus. We have his phone number, his direct line to his office, as well as an email. So what we require through our services is um, documentation, whether it be an IEP from the high school, um, any documentation you have from recent visits, updated visits from, from um, whether it be primary um, PCP or your other uh, doctors that included in your overall academic and personal goals plans, you would meet with our counselor, Roy Inoy, kind of go over some of the things that have worked for you in the past, what's currently working for you now, some of the different um, types of services you received prior, um, and then create a plan. Right, so if you require uh, extended test time, extended assignment time, private study rooms, right, you would generate that types of um, services at the beginning of the semester. Uh, it would be more, more beneficial if it's done prior to the semester, right? So as the first day of school, everything's already in place. Your instructors have been contacted. They know exactly what types of services you are getting from the disability services office. Um, and then those things can be jotted down and cleared up before classes start. Okay. Um, and then once that is done, our disabilities counselor will advocate for you throughout the entire semester. So doing the outreach, reaching out to the instructors, identifying what types of services you folks have discussed uh, privately, um, and then creating that connection, right? So doing the initial introduction of both the counselor and student to the instructor, uh, for every single course that you need services for, right? So he's not just going to reach out to one person. He's going to reach out to every single instructor that you have, um, you are requesting services for as a part of the work that you folks will do collaboratively throughout your entire uh, time at Winward. Or if you decide to go to KCC, Han CC, they'll have the similar processes in place. Student advocacy is very important to us. So on top of the services, I do, um, as I mentioned before, we are focused on access through the Disability Services Office. Now I wanna try and gear you towards some of the services we provide that lead towards your overall success at the campus. And I do wanna highlight our program, TRIO Student Support Services or TRIO SSS, which is a, a very prominent program on our campus who has helped hundreds, maybe thousands of students uh, with their success in college, including myself. I am, a, I am an alumni of TRIO, a proud alumni at that, where I've met some of the kindest peoples, my mentors, right, and lifelong friends. I put the link in, that, uh, in the chat as well to give you direct access to this webpage. 
So on top of some of the services you could um, partake in through disability services, there are other services as a part of TRIO that you can take advantage of. And keyword free, right? If it's free, it's for me, right? Everything that you is provided through TRIO student support services is absolutely free to, the, to all students, right? Who, are el who meet the eligible, eligibility requirements. So we offer individual and or small group tutoring. So you can do one-on-one -on -one with a tutor for any course that we have a tutor for. You can do small groups. We do small group tutorings uh, at Trio Student Support Services, one, which is one of our main buildings on campus. You can rent textbooks, right? So if we have textbooks on file uh, for a course that you're currently taking, we, uh, we do allow for rentals for the semester. We also allow rentals for laptops. Um, hotspots to get you access to um, the internet, right? So if we are in an area of spotty internet or we need to travel for classes, if we take online courses, we have the opportunity for hotspots. And then of course, uh, intensive and intentional academic advising with the TRIO Student Support Services Counselor, right? You'll be assigned your own general counselor when, you're, when you are accepted into Windward and the other CCs. And then the disability service counselor would be another service available to you, okay? Um, early registration for courses, right? So planning your academics early on and then registering prior before the rest of the campus, right? So TRIO, TRIO students have the luxury of registering about a week or so before the rest of the campus can register. And that's specific to our campus, right? So that's one of some of the benefits that students in TRIO get on our campus. And then we, we coordinate a number of different financial aid workshops, right? So we help students with FAFSA, Naho Kama, Kamehameha Schools applications, Alulike. You know, the list goes on. If it is providing financial aid assistance to students, we assist students with those types of applications to get funding, where essentially we've been able to get students technically paid to go to school, right? With having so much financial aid to pay for courses, um, students can get paid to go to class which is our overall goal, right? And then we, we also work on um, the transition and what financial aid looks like at the university level as com in comparison to the community colleges. And we also help with that transition as well. We do financial literacy. So helping students understand the difference between the different types of loans, credit cards, budgeting that you would uh, in inqu inquire about or even take on as a student. Right uh, or moving forward um, in your into adulthood, um, and understanding grant aid scholarships. So Trio has their own grant aid that they provide for students um, outside of different uh, applications that we provide workshops for. We do larger uh, financial aid nights. Uh, Trio sub, um, also provides free tax services, right, for students and the community at large. We do summer math courses that are very intentional, also intense where students taking summer classes, uh, math classes, with one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring, supplemental instruction, and then larger um, tutoring sessions at the TRIO, Trio SSS services. Uh, we do midnight madness. So during finals week, TRIO doesn't close until midnight, right? So providing access to students to be able to study for finals, get ample amount of time in quiet study spaces, in group settings, one-on-one, -on -one. whatever is a, the student, student is accustomed to, we will try and meet those accommodations at all times. We also have free printing, free computer use, right? On top of the, um, the, the laptop rentals, book rentals, and then of course, fun and food, right? TRIO is focused around uh, strengthening student connections, your peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and gaining lifelong friendships that extend both within the classroom and outside of the classroom. And Windward is also no personal bias, but Windward is just a beautiful campus to be at. Um, just the services that the University of Hawaii system does provide for students, um, it, it's humbling to be a part of the organization, right? To truly understand uh, affor affording students with access to accommodations that best fit their needs um, throughout their post-secondary um, adventures. So I think that's all I have for you folks right now. Uh, and then of course, we have time for questions for both myself and Eric. Um, but, but yeah, 
Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Ha'aheo. That was wonderful. That was a great overview of the program. And just because this is um, specific, you know, to Windward Community College, a lot of these services do extend to the other colleges. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So through our disability services, everything I've shown on our website um, is available at all of the other University of Hawaii system colleges in some shape or form. Yes. And you have assigned counselors at those campuses as well. Fantastic. And Eric, when you were talking about the supports and services that your program provides, is that specific to Manoa campus or does that extend to other campuses as well? Yeah, thanks for that. Presently, um, it's actually all the community colleges. So especially with online support provision in the TIPSID program, the students with, uh, for students with intellectual disabilities, we can do coaching statewide. DDD, we can do coaching statewide. And shortly with DVR, we will have a, a contract in place to also offer statewide support. Um, we are working on four-year programs to be at West Oahu, uh, um, University of Hawaii Hilo, and UH Manoa as well. Those are going to be in progress over the next four years. And yeah, that's about it. Oh, but first I'd say, hey, I'm interpreters. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I only had 15 minutes. I'm sorry I was so fast. Hopefully people can watch this in you know a video separately <laughs> but if you need more information please reach out and thank you interpreters and apologies ksl users today thanks eric no worries we are going we are recording this session we will have it captioned for folks and up on the website in a couple of weeks so uh, look for that no no worries at all michelle i see you are one of our q a monitors do we have some questions yes, for our panelists there is a Question from Megan Everett, and I do believe that this is for Eric. What are the age restrictions for your program? Um, for the TIPSID program, there are no age restrictions. Uh, for DDD, there are no age restrictions. For DVR, there may be age restrictions depending on a couple of different uh, variables. One, uh, possibly potentially eligible students may age out. And um, that's a, an issue to be brought up with DVR to talk about that. but. The relatively few age restrictions. Uh, and right now, I think that was the only question. Anita had a question, um, but it was regarding SSI. So I thought I would um, bring that up when we did the all. Uh, are there any other questions that you would like to um, ask Eric and Hale? Please enter them into the question and answer box. Do you, do you mind if I just add something if we have a minute or two? Please do. Uh, yeah, so th thank you. So the, yeah, there are a lot of, of opportunities for students once uh, they get through the door. So, you know, your transition teacher at your high school, they're very helpful individuals that can help connect to us and other programs. Um, once they get there, then our coaches also can help connect to the various supports and uh, disability support office like um, Hale was talking about has lots of opportunities um, and lots of support mechanisms, but you just need documentation to get in the door. So sometimes we help the students we work with get ready for that. And most of the campuses do have a TRIO program. LCC doesn't, uh, but most of the others do. And, and like uh, we shared, it's pretty awesome. The services are, are prioritized for people with disabilities and first generation college students and people dealing with uh, financial and other you know, socioeconomic issues in their application. So the so support is there. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding it. And uh, we'll try our best to connect you to the sports that are available. Um, there is a question from Desi McKenzie. Please explain how students with disabilities can access college for the socialization purposes, for socialization purposes. And I guess that's open to both of you. Um, I could start if you want. OK. So. Um, what, what we're really looking for is, yeah, uh, socialization and, and is a byproduct of inclusion. Um, what we're, for the programs that we were in, the expectation is a student is trying to learn as much as they can, that they want to be a college student and they're trying to work on that. And so that's how our system and program is set up. It's about, uh, you know, aspirational attainment of education. And some of the students, you know, they struggle a lot at the beginning of, for the classes. And so they take, you know, the classes they can do and they sometimes will take them for credit or credit or audit if their skills aren't there yet. But the expectation is, in our programs at least, is it's not an experience program. 
It's an authentic inclusion opportunity in education. So as long as the expectation is to learn and work, <laughs> then the social by inclusion is a byproduct. Uh, we don't do anything that's like, you know, come on campus and, you know, eat at the cafeteria. That's, there are a lot of people that do that. And it's pretty much during regular times, not COVID times. It's an open campus that you can do that. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry for the limitation, but it, for ours, it is you're focused on education. You want to work hard. And um, then the, the social part is a byproduct. So sometimes okay. we, sorry. No, just, go ahead, Eric. One last thing. Uh, there are classes that are no credit. So sometimes students will take those because uh, there's very low barrier to entry. It's like Office of Continuing Education and Workforce Development offers classes like starting from keyboarding and Microsoft Office Suite. And they, you can learn those basic skills there without credit risk. And those classes are very inexpensive. And that's a great way to get started. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing, Eric. Um, and with regards to socialization in terms of the larger campus, I think a lot of that's connected to the different programs and services we have to offer. Uh, so, of course, the uh, socialization between counselor, right, over time, it's a strong, it's a solid relationship, right, because you work, you work together so long. You start to understand things about one another, what works for, for best for, for both, um, identifying the needs of, of both students. But with regards to the aspects of your, men, your, your peers, you know, some, that comes from programs like TRIO, right, where there's a large influx in the center where everyone's so outgoing and, and really intentional about creating friendships, study groups uh, that extend outside of the classroom, right, um, in the classroom, right, taking the right instructor, and we have great instructors across the system taking the right instructor that really focuses on inclusion, teamwork, uh, group work, where you are socializing in, in the context where you won't you wouldn't necessarily normally do on your own. Right. But the beauty of that is it also strengthens those um, relationships in the court, in the classroom that extend beyond where you folks are eating lunch together. You're doing smaller study groups, hanging out at the library, your local coffee shop um, at the library or just hanging out in areas you feel comfortable. Additionally, we have uh, student government, right? Uh, different clubs on campus that are open to all students uh, to be able to be a, a member of. Um, so I think the things are, those socialization pieces are already in place. It's about us uh, being able to um, make our way there, introduce ourselves, get comfortable. Um, and then the rest of it, it'll take off. Um, it, and it's, it's just great opportunities across the system uh, to be a, a part of a college system, but more importantly, you know, at the community college levels, uh, to be a part of a family, right? Uh, everyone is really um, engaged in your success. They want you to succeed while also providing the access that you need to your education at the post-secondary level. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I really want to speak to that, especially at WCC and some of the other campuses, there really is that feeling where they're trying to make you feel at home and, and part of the group there. And uh, I would just add that there are other opportunities too. So if, if, you're, if your child or your student is a person with a disability who also has Native Hawaiian heritage, there are quite a few other programs that provide support. In fact, we have three of them. Um, we have programs that support people who are at risk of school failure who are Native Hawaiian. And we also have programs that are STEM focused. So if, you're, if your child or the student or person you're supporting is also Native Hawaiian, there's another level of support that's available as well. Um, so Amanda had a question. Um, do you have to attend full-time in order to access these supports? Eric had already answered that for the CDS, students um, don't have to be full-time. They can only take one class. And I wondered if Ha'aheo could also um, answer that question also. Yes, great. That's a great question. So our services are provided to all University of Hawaii students. So whether you're taking one class, three classes, five classes, these services are available to you. Um, and of course, that and that's the beauty of working with uh, advisors or counselors. You can identify what works best for your schedule. What, we can start off with one course, right? Get a feel for it, get a feel of college, get, you know, different environment, different types of rigor. And then as time goes on, the semester passes, you can then uh, decide to add on a couple more, right? Or add on one more and then gradually take that process to where uh, you're, you're comfortable with taking a, a fuller load, right? The only, the only 
thing that gets affected with the part-time type schedules are in fact like financial aid, right? So financial aid is adjusted based on the amount of courses you are taking or the amount of credits you are taking and the amount awarded is adjusted based on those types of credits, right? But great question. As long as you're taking a class um, within the UH system, we will be able to uh, provide those services for you. And it'll be directly tied to that campus. So when uh, WCC's Disability Service Office won't necessarily be able to help you with a course at KCC, the KCC Disability Services will help you get the accommodations on their campus, right? So it's campus specific with regards to the types of accommodations um, per courses. Okay, so, uh, Megan had a question. Um, oh. do Sorry, can I just add something right quick? Okay. Okay, so one thing about it is um, the counselors at most of the community colleges are on an, under the assumption that the students need to be on a full load. So there is a need to advocate a little bit because there's been a number of times where the students were kind of up up because <laughs> they're they're focused on completion and getting people out in a re, you know typical period of time. So uh, that's just one thing. But yeah, definitely you can do one one class. You can you know, build up to it. That's our hope with the students that aren't as prepared as they'll start small, build on that success and get to the point where they're doing a full load. Okay, thank you. Um, so Megan Everett had a question. Do you all work with nonverbal individuals with disabilities? Uh, great question. Uh, we have. Um, the, the one thing is uh, trying to understand how that fits with a, the college program. The basic expectation is the, the person's going to be in a class usually by themselves for, you know, 50 minutes or longer. Um, so is the person prepared to do that in a way that is conducive to the classroom environment of learning? So a person can even have a one-on-one -on -one along with them, but that is an accommodation that needs to be requested through the DSO office. So there's a little extra step if there is a caseworker or a direct support worker that rides along. Um, but yeah, we have in the past. It really just depends um, where they're at. And especially that independent functioning is a, is a component. I will tell you that there's uh, some students we've worked with over the years that had some you know, behaviors or sort of issues. And overall, I'd say the, the college is very supportive. And I would call, mentioned uh, WCC, because one of the students we worked with had an incident there and the teacher and the students just jumped in to help this person through what they were experiencing. And it was like, when we heard about it, what had happened, we we're like, wow, community colleges are great. You know, it's not always perfect. There's also examples of the, on the other side, but I will say that, you know, it's a, it's a very good place for that. Um, but the number one thing is we need to know at the beginning what, what we're working with. So the intake process might take a little bit longer in a situation like that. So we can figure out how to support the student to be ready for a successful experience. That's the only thing that's a challenge for us. And when there's something we don't know about and we can't predict the support or the behaviors or issues that might come up, which as long as we know about it, we can try to figure out a plan. We have a very good project coordinator who is also a licensed clinical social worker and has been with us a bunch of years. And she does our intakes. And uh, once we get that information, we try to build a plan. Sometimes people enter the program and don't take classes right away. So we kind of figure out how to integrate uh, over a semester or two. Hi, Hale, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I just uh, want to follow up with Eric had mentioned, um, I think more specifically the timing, right? The timing is important uh, to ensure that the access to these accommodations are put in place in a timely fashion. Right. So if you're if your senior knows that they're going to go to WCC or KCC in the fall semester, right, the assumptions made that applications are being put together and submitted for fall. As once with that decision is made, we're accepted, right? Then that should already start the ball rolling for the different types of services that you may need. So reaching out to your disability service office, um, setting that initial foundation with the with the counselor there. And then setting up meetings to then identify the different types of accommodations needed. And a sum the summertime, if you're enrolling in fall, is a great time to do it, right? Um, it's a little slower, right? Um, the services um, are not as needed much in the summer due to the um, re reduction in courses offered. So uh, summer is the best time to start the, um, the conversation with the disability service counselor to then put things into place by fall semester, right? Because... If we start the conversation May or June, even July, there's enough time to make sure that all of the documents have been received, 
all of the accommodations have been discussed. And then, you know, all those draftings to, to instructors come the, the week prior are in place and you're ready to go for the first day of classes. Perfect. Um, Leanne Estrada had a question. Maybe this was answered, but is the CDS program available on all islands? And would we go through my child's case manager at her high school for contact? Um, yes. So yeah, we did sort of talk about that, but just to clarify, uh, students who are with DDD, they've already are in and receiving case management services. They are eligible all islands. If they're individuals with intellectual disabilities, meaning they score less than 75 on an IQ test and have one or more limitations in functional areas, which people are aware of, uh, then we can support people on neighbor islands as well. DVR is, we're still working on that. So the DVR uh, path, it will be there, but we are you know, working on making it happen. So these um, last, uh, these few questions are um, geared towards Eric and Ha'ahel. So from Desi McKenzie, I think this ties into her previous question regarding the socialization. I am speaking of students who may not be at a functioning level to be able to perform academically, i.e. accessing college courses like cooking, dance, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I, I would say like to figure out, it's an individualized program. So we would, uh, the best thing would be to reach out um, and talk to us directly about the system, the, the situation your child or the person you're supporting is in. Um, yeah, there's, there are some programs that don't have any academic connection, but we, just because of our funding, the way we're program is set up, it's, it's an education focus, take a class kind of thing. You can take a class and take it credit, no credit, or you can audit a class if um, the, the possibilities of passing are really uh, challenging, but you'd still go to coaching, you'd still go to class, you know, you'd still, you know, try and do what you can do. And that's where we're at. Um, that's kind of the limitation we're at, but individually, just please contact us and we can try to talk to you about the situation and see if there's a fit with us. Okay, so Amanda Kahanui yep. had a question. How does my, oh, wait. What happened? <laughs> wait, wait. I was throwing some in there. I know. Wait. And they Ooh, got can I ask questions? Wait. So Amanda asked, if a student is exiting high school this year, when should we contact the disability office? I think Ha Hale did um, answer that a bit, right? It was uh, as early as possible. Um, once the application is in, May, June, July is best. Um, and she had a follow-up question. How does my child disclose disability for disability services? Well, that's a great question. And that's one of those conversations that you would have with a disability services counselor. Um, and and that, that can come from any form, whether it be from the IEP or other documentation from um, their physician. And then having those conversations, right? Um, but it's more so reaching out, right? So to start that discussion, it's about um, understanding who to go to. Right. Who is the counselor on each respective campus that I need to speak to in order to get these accommodations for my student? So um, I share with ours and then it may take some navigating on other campus web pages. But about disclosing that, it's like you would do that in the confidential process uh, through reaching out to the to the counselor and then having those discussions. Um, I, I could add to that. Um, you work with your transition teacher. Um, most people probably know this, but each school is supposed to have a funded transition teacher. Uh, sometimes those funds don't go to a transition teacher and that somebody else is wearing that hat. But um, a lot of times they'll prepare a binder or transition materials for the student to have. Those materials are very important. They include assessments and records and things like that that will help the DSO make that determination for support. All righty. Um... Anita had a question before. Actually, I think it was uh, before Eric and ha Hale's presentation, um, but she had asked, thanks so much for your time today. Is anyone able to speak to the SSI application process? Our son turns 18 shortly, as well as other government services. And Amanda had placed in the chat links to past SPIN conferences that address these questions. Um, and so far- Thank you, Michelle. That's the only- 
questions. Any other questions? This is for all presenters. Um, please enter your questions into the chat box. I mean, not the chat box, the question and answer box, please. Thanks, Michelle. And so I did post um, questions about Social Security um, eligibility and all of that we didn't talk about today, but SPIN, Special Parent Information Network, we have a SPIN conference website, and we have done a spring workshop with um, transition topics, one of them about financial planning. And then at our 2021 conference we had in October, we had a, um, a a networking room, which didn't get recorded, but we did record all of the questions. And we had a representative from our local SSI or SSA office, Social Security office, came and talked about that. So if you'd like more information, I did post them in the chat. You can always reach out to SPIN and we can get you connected there or just um, tootle around the SPIN conference website and see what you can find there too. Uh, there is a, a question in the chat here. Right. I can read that. Is it ever, it's from Liz, is it ever too late to apply for DD services? I am speaking for my 32-year-old brother-in-law that still needs a lot of guidance. He's partially blind and still needs help managing daily medications. Oh, this is Abigail. Um, no, it's never too late um, to apply for DD services. Um, believe it or not, we've had um, some family members that apply well in their 50s. Um, you know, they just like yourself, you receive care from family members. Um, but yeah, it's never too late. We take applications um, up until at the very end. So um, yeah, make sure you um, contact our intake office and then they'll be able to help you. Perfect. And I'm going to drop a link to the transition website that has the workbooks and the toolkits that you can look at. Um, Center on Disability Studies just dropped a huge, it's like 170 pages or something crazy, but it's a, a great, very comprehensive uh, toolkit for families doing transition. And it covers really all aspects of transition. And then we have um, individual island specific transition workbooks talking about different parts of it as well and they're they're nice because they are specific to your island with different links to different agencies so i'll drop the oh willie's got them thank you willie is dropping the links in the chat for you so please do visit our website footsteps of transition.weebly.com you can download those workbooks we've got tips for you there's websites there uh, michelle's <clears throat> excuse me michelle's um health Transition documents are in there as well. We will get this information posted there. All of the presentations you saw will get uploaded um, by next week. So um, please do look for them there. We want you to consider that as your transition resource. Um, as, as someone was mentioning, you know, schools are, most schools have, high schools have a transition coordinator, but not all of them do. You're looking at your care coordinator to help you get those transition services done. Um, and we here at, at the planning, the planning Committee for Footsteps want to give you this one-stop shop to come for all your transition needs. So if you're seeing something that you need and it's not listed on the website, please email us. Our contact information is on the website and we'll do our best to get that up for you, okay? All right, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, does anybody have anything else to add? Any comments or last bit of wisdom that they want to share? Because I, I don't know when I'm presenting I'll go through my whole thing and then I'm done and I go, oh, there was always that one last thing that I really wanted to tell people and I forgot. So here's our chance for panelists. If there's that, that last minute thing you wanna, wanna make sure folks know or leave with, uh, please do share. Um, this is Abby. Um, this is for the question about um, applying for your um, brother who is a little older than high school transition. Um, a tip that I have learned from family members as, that are going through this process is um, oftentimes when um, one is applying to DDD, um, they are missing a critical document that shows that the disability occurred before 18 or before 22. So that's oftentimes where a lot of um, applicants who are um, older in age, um, they get stuck in this process because unfortunately they don't have a um, document that shows that the um, eligible condition occurred um, before 18 or 22. So that's um, 
extremely helpful for families if they can make sure they keep track of these documents. Um, any type of assessment you've had for your child um, or your loved one, um, just make sure you keep it and archive it because more than likely we'll need it during this eligibility process. Thanks, Abby. That's really helpful. And we do have Department of Education folks here. We have district representatives. We have DESs here. Uh, I think there's still a few of them are still here. Thank you for hanging out with us today. So if you've got questions about the process as well, you know what's happening, we, we should really be talking at, at age 14, middle school, about what's going to happen when our kids transition out of high school. And sometimes it gets deferred because our middle school folks may not know the answers and nobody likes to say they don't know, right? Or they think, oh, that can, that can happen once you get to high school. But these conversations, because you can see there's a lot going on. It's not just, you know, once I leave high school, they're going to go to a day program and then that's it for them. No, you have a lot of things to think about as a parent, right? We've got health stuff. We've got work stuff. We've got socialization stuff. We've got where are they gonna be, transportation really start thinking now. And, and I know we had some folks sign up that had kids in elementary school, and we're glad to see that because it's really not too soon to think about in transition. What's going to happen to your kiddo? Talk to your child. What do they like to do? What do they want to do? Where do they see themselves? And that's going to change over the years, or it may not. Um, and, and even if they think about just one, like maybe they have blinders on. My, my, I'm going to give you my example. My kiddo wants to be a filmmaker and everything is all about film. But the reality is he loves animals and he loves small children. So we're trying to help him see that there's other opportunities out there for him to discover maybe job opportunities or volunteer opportunities. He's going to get those soft skills. He's going to meet people. He's going to make connections. So be thinking about your kiddo, what they need what they want to do, and then look at this group of folks that can help you and guide you on this journey to transition, taking those steps one step at a time. Could I make a last pitch? Yes, please. It might have got overshadowed in the focus on college, but I just want to mention one more time, and I, I sent, Amanda, I sent you all my documents already. Um, we have these self-determination training uh, opportunities that are no cost, thanks to DDD. And if you are a you know, special education teacher and you want us to come out and talk to the other special education teachers there about the self-determination training content, we're happy to do that. We go out to schools, we work with students in transition and age. Um, we've done that at Farrington for years and it, it, you know, that's again, no cost. So you just have to reach out and, and ask for it and we'll try to figure out how to do it with you. The other thing I just wanna mention is uh, DVR, we've trained all of DVR's um, Oahu branch staff, except for the newest ones, <laughs> but they made a commitment to this, this content too. So we can do agency-wide, we can do whatever. We've done the training on neighbor islands with uh, support providers and you know, direct support workers are really grateful for that training opportunity usually, because it's like, you, that's a job where you've got to hit the ground running. So just, it's free. Maybe we should charge for it. You know, Maybe people would think, oh, it's more valuable because we charge for it. Well, you can write checks payable to Eric. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, it's out there. Just look at the brochure and we're happy to come out and, and offer that training or we can do it in person or online. Thanks for the free pitch. <laughs> and thanks okay. to for, uh, DDD for supporting that initiative. So we have a couple more comments and a question and answer. Kathleen Anderson Momoa made a comment. Thank you for your time and energy. Best transition meeting I have ever witnessed. Have a great weekend and keep up the great work you all do for Hawaii. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, Reina, have these agencies taken into consideration the amount of valuable time lost to students? Oops, what happened? Oh, there. <laughs> During COVID, my senior has had no experience with DVR and very minimal with community-based activities. Are there any accommodation for these students that lost this crucial time? That's a good question. I'd say get them connected to your um, care coordinator, right? See if DVR can come in, see if they're eligible. They may be, um, and Cheryl, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but um, there's a name for it. 
um, something stepped in, my brain stopped working. If you are um, potentially eligible, that's what I'm thinking of, potentially eligible. Sorry, student. Amanda, yes, potentially yeah. eligible student. We can start serving them as early as 14, provide them a limited five services, and before being determined eligible for those individualized services. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Super, thanks Cheryl. So work with your team at school, you know, invite the DVR folks, see what's available, see what kind of classes might be happening um, this spring. Um, my son took some classes through the DVR programs, you know, through those community resource programs, and they were very helpful and helped him kind of get something in the summer that he was able to do. So really start exploring, check out some of these great um, speaker websites that are here today. Uh, to, to move forward and you can always reach out to us at Footsteps and we can get you connected. Um, Chris had a couple comments. Um, first, yes, Eric, please. We need this on Maui schools, middle schools and high school and would also like DDD DVR people to meet with school teachers and counselors so the parents can get the information. Hi, this is Abby from um, DDD. Yes, we do. Um, I do presentations um, for a lot of different schools and their team of teachers, um, special ed teachers. So if you have a school that is interested in a presentation from DDD, um, I can go ahead and include our training unit email and then we can go ahead and provide um, an outreach presentation for you folks. We've done for many, I think we've done for Central Dist District, um, Waipahu High School is a few, so yeah, feel free to reach out and we can um, definitely provide you with a um, presentation. Hey, uh, Abby, um, it's also an opportunity if you want to include the SD training as an offer because you guys are paying for it. So <laughs> that might why be why not? <laughs> talk about like anytime you do those outreaches, oh, you yeah, know, you awesome. ask us to go along and yeah. So anytime, Eric. We should have thought about that. Can you remember and we'll talk about it? <laughs> if you're doing outreach, just invite us. <laughs> Um, Chris had a follow-up uh, comment. So um, as a proactive parent, I seem to be the person educating the schools, teachers, and parents. I don't mind, but I don't have a lot of information or experience. You folks are also helpful, and it is great to let the community know about it. Thank you, Chris. Um, Thanks for that, Chris. Um, we also, Cynthia, who is one of our um, Department of Ed folks that are here today. Thank you, Cynthia. But her mic wasn't working and she wanted to make sure you folks know that if you feel like your child has had learning loss due to COVID, do please contact your IEP team and call a meeting together and you can discuss learning loss and services um, through COVID impact services that can make up those, um, that learning loss that you feel may have happened. So definitely contact your IEP team if you feel that COVID has impacted their learning and they can help you to get services that will happen before or after school. They don't happen during the school day, but they can happen around and wrap around your child's education. So reach out to your care coordinator or your DES if you're not sure how to proceed. Any other questions, please enter them in the question and answer. going to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I think also today I wanted to give a quick shout out to Heather Chapman. Heather, if you're on, um, please just show your camera real quick and give a, a wave. Heather is our new state level. So we have state level, district level, school levels, right? At the state level, Heather Chapman is our new transition coordinator or transition person. And we haven't had someone in that state position for a while as a permanent position. So we're super excited to have her. She's really involved in our work groups and in our planning here. So um, we're hoping we'll see more from her and we'll also see that kind of trickle down to our schools. So uh, welcome Heather to the Footsteps of Transition Fair Ohana. Okay, so we are wrapping up. Last chance is to put some questions in the chat, uh, in the Q and A for us. Ooh, I think one might have popped in there. Um, please do visit our website and please do fill out the evaluation for us. Okay, Michelle, was there one more question in the Q and A? Uh, it was just uh, it was Cynthia in the chat. 
that Dr. So, Chapman okay. had another meeting. I'll let you know you recognized her. Gotcha. Oh, and then Heather said, I'm here. <laughs> Tech difficulty. Please reach out if you have questions. And Heather um, entered her e email address. Fantastic. Thanks so much, yeah. Heather, for sharing your email with folks. Uh, now, don't get her bombarded with, you know, stuff that you could talk to your school. But if you want more information or want to make connections, do you know who your person that you should be talking to at the school is? Uh, reach out and, and, uh, and ask and find out. And then she'd be happy to help you. We're, we're excited to have her on board. Okay. I'm going to give, I'm gonna give one, one more moment. I, I hate awkward, weird silences on Zooms. So <laughs> I don't want it to sit too quietly and I didn't set up music, but we also want to make sure that if you have a question, we don't cut you off early. Otherwise, we're going to thank you so much for coming and joining us on a Saturday morning uh, for our Footsteps to Transition Fair. This is for school year 21-22. And so please look for us again for the next school year. We'll be planning starting soon uh, for the next event, hopefully in person. But again, thinking about a statewide conference that will probably be on Zoom so we can involve everybody. Uh, if we don't have anybody, anything else, I'm going to say mahalo from our Footsteps to Transition Planning Committee on behalf of all of our speakers. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you.